The Life of Dwight L. Moody, Chapter 24, Brooklyn, Philadelphia, and New York. How is it that while you and other like men are all but inaccessible, fenced in by closed doors and guarded by polite but immovable private secretaries, Dwight L. Moody sees you at any time, was asked of a certain prominent financier. He is one of us, was the reply. From the first of his evangelical work in America, Mr. Moody's sound judgment inspired the confidence of men of affairs, while his loyalty to the gospel and all of simplicity without champion theological fads recommended him to the ministers who believed in evangelistic efforts. He also earned the respect of laymen who were able to give him the opportunity for larger enterprises. This had been demonstrated in the work in Great Britain, and on his return to his own country, the same general support was afforded in the larger American cities, which had extended to him the heartiest invitations. These invitations were readily accepted, for, as Mr. Moody expressed it, water runs downhill, and the highest hills in America are the great cities. If we can stir them, we should still stir the whole country. The first American campaign was begun in Brooklyn, October 1875. Preparations had been made for these meetings not only by providing places for assemblage and arranging a program for the exercises, but by the union of various denominations and holding meetings for prayer and conferences and pledging one another to a cordial cooperation in the effort of the evangelists upon whose work in Great Britain the divine blessing was so signally rested. A rink was engaged for a month, and chairs for 5,000 persons were provided. As the interest in the services grew, greater efforts were put forth to reach more people in increasing the number of meetings. The help of local ministers and prominent laymen were enlisted in overflow meetings, and special services in churches and halls widened the scope of the work. The influence of the mission extended beyond Brooklyn. The New York Tribune, commenting editorially on the work, said, there is a common-sense view to be taken of this matter, as of every other. In the first place, why should we sneer? Because a large part of the multitudes crowded into the Brooklyn rink are drawn there only by curiosity. So they were when they followed Christ into the streets of Jerusalem or the wilderness. Yet they went, and went to the healing of their souls. Or that a still larger part already professes Christianity and believes all that Moody and Sankey teach. There is not one of them who will not be the better for a little quickening of his faith, and we may add, of his movement too. In the second place, with regard to the men themselves, there can, we think, be but one opinion as to their sincerity. They are not money-makers, charlatans, declarists, conservative England, which reprobated both their work and the manner of it, held them in the full blaze of scrutiny for months, and could not detect in them a single motive that was not pure. Earnest and sincere men are rare in these days. It is not worth, is it not worth our while to give to them a dispassionate, unprejudiced hearing? Thirdly, in regard to their message, they preach no new doctrine, no dogma of this or that sect, nothing but Christ and the necessity among us of increased zeal in their service. Which of us will controvert that truth? If the Christian religion is not the one hope for all individual and social life, what is? And lastly, with regard to the method of these men in presenting Christ and his teaching, men of high culture or exceptional sensitiveness of taste shrink from the familiarity of words and ideas in which a subject they hold is reverent and sublime beyond expression is set forth to the crowd. They call it vulgarizing and facing the truth, granting that their opinion is right. From their point of view, what is to be done with the crowd? They cannot all be men of fine culture or exceptional sensitivityness. They are not moved to believe or trust Jesus through philosophical arguments or contemplation of nature or logical conviction or appeals to their aesthetic senses by classical music, stained glass, or church architecture. They are plain, busy people with ordinary minds and tastes. Yet certainly, as Christ died to save them, it is necessary that they should be uh, brought to him by some means or persuaded to live cleaner, higher, more truthful lives. Christianity is not a matter of grammar for libraries and draw rooms, refined taste, or delicate sensibility. It was not to the culture classes that Christ himself preached, but to the working people, the publicans, fishermen, 
tax collectors, and he used the words and illustrations that would appeal to them most forcibly. If Monsignor Moody or Sankey or any other teachers bring him directly home to men's convictions and lead them to amend their lives for his sake, let us thank God for the preacher, and let his taste and grammar take care of themselves. In Philadelphia, a no less notable series of meetings was conducted in the recently abandoned freight depot of the Pennsylvania Railroad, which had since become the widely known Wanamaker store. This building was provided with seats to accommodate 13,000 persons and was over otherwise adapted to the needs of a large mission hall. Here, as in Brooklyn, the leading ministers gave their hearty support to the work and in every way expressed their approval of the effort. Separate meetings for different classes of hearers were started early in the work. Mr. Moody said that he was going to have the meeting for young men limited to those under 40 as that would just take him in. His 40th birthday was celebrated near the close of the campaign. One meeting was set especially for intemperate men and women. At Mr. Moody's request, a large number of people who had been regularly attending the meeting remained away from their seats and might be occupied by those for whom the meeting was especially designed. The audience had been described as follows by a witness. Here and there could be seen the bloated faces of bleared-eyed bleared drunkards glancing wildly around as though the strangeness of the situation was so overpowering that it required a great effort of will to remain. Not a few were accompanied by mothers, wives, sisters, or friends who, having exhausted human means, had determined to lay the burden upon the Lord. The great majority of those gathered in the Depot Tabernacle yesterday afternoon were a sad-faced and tearful collection of humanity as it would be possible to assemble in one place. Those who had not directly suffered by intemperance grew at once into sympathy with the hundreds of them whose heavy sighs told stories of unutterable anguish, and this influence increased until a cloud of terrible depression seemed to hang over the entire congregation. Every class of society was represented in the strong, united so closely by such painful bonds. Close to the half-starved, half-abused, yet faithful wife of some besoted brute was seated the child of fortune and culture, child no more but an old, old woman whose only son, still in his youth, had fallen amongst to the, to the, almost to the lowest depths of degradation. Next to her was a man whose every feature showed nobility of soul and rare talents, but whose threadbare coat and sunken cheeks betrayed him to all observers as the lifelong victim of the unconquerable appetite. Just behind this group was a young girl whose face, sweet as an angel's, was already furred with grief. Beside her was her father, who, broken down in health and almost ruined in mind by the excess of use of liquor, seemed at last to have resigned himself to hopeless ruin. He glazed about in half asleep, half childish way, and several times attempted to get up and leave his seat. But the hand of the child woman held his very tightly, and each time he would conquer his restlessness and sit down. By far the larger proportion of the congregation were, were women almost all of whom had evidently, evidently clutching at their hearts the agonizing impact of some past or present experience with woe in its most terrible form. It is interesting to see the changes that gradually came over the audiences as Mr. Moody declared over and over again that God, who had once cast out devils, could do it again, and right then and there, and, and would do it if only asked. And as the fever and prayers for immediate help were offered, the clouds seemed to rise from their hearts while the noonday sun poured upon them its blessed rays of hope and eyes long dimmed by tears beamed with a new light. Among the laymen who were prominent in this work were John Wanamaker and George H. Stewart. Mr. Wanamaker's special meetings for young men were largely attended at this time. As on former occasions, Mr. Moody observed the closing of the old year with a special service with Dr. Henry Clay Thrumbolt, who describes, the central figure on the platform that New Year's Eve was one whose appearance and bearing were most impressive. The Reverend Dr. William S. Plummer, then a, a professor at the Columbia Theological Seminary in South Carolina, and who nearly 40 years before was moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, was a figure that would compel reverence and regard in any gathering. Massive in frame, towering in stature, venerable in appearance, with snowy hair and flowing beard, he suggested Michelangelo's Moses. Mr. Moody was on this occasion represented, not as the teacher, but as the inquirer. Dr. Plummer, 
stood out as a teacher to hear him the young Moody. Younger Moody came with his questionings of heart. Few men, if any, in the world better knew the anxious cravings and doubts of the inquiring soul than Moody, as he had met with them in his varied evangelistic labors. Few trained theologians could have more wisely and simply answered these inquirers than the large-brained, large-hearted, large-framed, venerable patriarch before whom Moody stood. The whole scene evidenced the simplicity of trust in God, as the sinner came to him through Jesus Christ in his need and in his confidence. The theologian could give the answer that the anxious soul longed for. Mr. Moody and Dr. Plummer were at once in this interview. A few spe specimen questions and answers were, was illustrated, will illustrate. Mr. Moody, is a given amount of distress necessary to genuine conversion? Dr. Plummer, Liddy had no distress, we read of none. When God opened her heart, she attended to the things spoken by Paul, but the jailer of Philippi would not have accepted Christ without some alarm. If you will accept the Son of God, you have no you, you need have no trouble. There is nothing in trouble that sanctifies the soul. Mr. Moody, well, doctor, what is conversion? Dr. Plummer, glory be to God, there is such a thing as, as conversion. To be converted is to turn from sin, self-will, self-righteousness, all self-confidence, and from sin itself, and be turned to Christ. Mr. Moody, can a man be saved here tonight before 12 o'clock, saved all at once? Dr. Plummer, why not? In my Bible, I read of 3,000 men gathered together one morning, all of them murderers, their hands stained with the blood of the Son of God. They meet in the morning, and before night, they were all baptized members of Christ. Mr. Moody, how can I know that I am saved, Dr. Plummer? Because of the fact that God is true. Let God be true, but every man a liar. If I accept Jesus Christ, it is not Mr. Moody's word, nor Mr. Sankey's, nor Dr. Newton's, it is the word of the living God, whose name is Amen. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Mr. Moody, what if I haven't got faith enough? Dr. Plummer, glory be to God, if I can touch the hem of my Savior's garment, I shall be saved. A little faith is as true faith as a great deal of faith. A little coal of fire in the ashes is as truly fire as the glowing heat of a furnace. Mr. Moody, I don't feel that I love Christ enough, Dr. Plummer, and you never will. To all eternity, you never will love him as much as he deserves to be loved. Had I ten thousand tongues, not one should be silent. Had I ten thousand hearts, I'd give them all to thee. As the hour of midnight approached, the appeals of Mr. Moody following this illustrative inquiry meeting grew more and more earnest and the solemnity of his service deepened. Just before twelve o'clock, he asked all present to join in silent prayer. While all heads were still bowed, the profound stillness was broken by Mr. Sankey's singing up, almost persuaded. Then the closing moments of the passing year were given in earnest prayer, especially for those who had risen to ask for it at Mr. Moody's call, and were now urged to a final decision. When, at midnight, the sounding out of the bell of Independence Hall was a signal for all bells in the city and steam whistles on, on every side to greet the incoming year, Mr. Moody wished all a happy new year and that never to be forgotten watch night service closed. Its echoes were, are still resounding in many hearts on earth and in heaven, and their gratitude is now deeper than ever to dear Mr. Moody and his fellow workers on that sacred occasion. The late George H. Stewart then, thus spoke at the Philadelphia meetings a few weeks after their close. In October last, we attempted a great work for God in our city. Some had high expectations that it would redound largely to the glory of heaven. They saw a deep spirit of prayer among the clergymen and members of the churches, and what has been the result? It has far exceeded the highest hopes of the most sanguines. It had little thought to see a hall filled to overflowing day after day with, uh, with from 7,000 to 13,000 people who came to hear the old, old story of Jesus and his love. God heard our prayer, and his work has been continued in all our churches. In my own church, an old Scotch church, which has been little disposed to unite in such religious movements, I have seen what I have never seen before during the 40 years that I have known him. At the morning meeting in the Depot Church, and on Sundays, 
at the early hour at which people came was remarkable. The watchman told me that he saw men gathering there as early as 4.30 a.m. And at 6 o'clock on cold mornings in January, the throng was so great that he was obliged to open the doors. My church has had two pastors in 75 years. On Sunday next, it will hold a special communion service, something it has not known in years, and 25 new communicants will be there. Two-thirds of them are young men. During the Philadelphia mission, a number of Princeton students attended the evangelistic meetings and were greatly impressed. Returning to their college, they began working for an invitation to Mr. Moody to come and preach to the students. The work inaugurated at the, that time developed later into organizations that have continued fruitfully, not only among American students, but throughout the world. The last notable mission of that winter was conducted in New York. At a meeting of clergymen and laymen in June 1875, while Mr. Moody was still in London, a temporary organization was formed, of which the late Reverend Dr. John Hall was chairman. By the unanimous vote of all present, a cordial invitation was extended to the evangelists to hold a series of religious meetings in New York as soon as their engagements would permit. On the acceptance of this invitation, a permanent organization was formed and careful preparations were made for the proposed meetings. William E. Dodge was president of the General Committee. George H. Andrews, Bowles, Colgate, and Henry Oakley, vice presidents, and more than 30 clergymen representing nearly all the Protestant denominations and as many laymen were members of, that, of this committee. The executive committee consisted of Nath Bishop, chairman, John C. Havemeyer, secretary, and William E. Dodge, Jr., the Reverend Dr. S. Uh, Prime, S. B. Shefflin, Elliot, Elliot Shepherd, Morse Je, um, Jessup, and R. R. McBurney. The committee obtained a lease of the Hippodrome on the site of the present Medicine Square Garden at Madison Avenue and 4th Avenue between 26th and 27th Street as the most central and suitable building for the meetings. The auditorium was divided into two large halls, each capable of seating about 7,000 persons, and a call was issued by the committee for a private guaranteed fund to meet attendant expenses. In the call, it was stated that it must be distinctly understood that Monsieur Moody and Sankey refuse to receive any payment for their own services. Thus, no part of the above fund will be paid to them. While the committee were attending to the business details, Christian people were not idle in the churches. There was an increased interest in meetings for prayer and religious conferences. The daily prayer meeting uptown at Lairk Hall was largely attended, while the uh, Fulton Street meeting felt the fresh impulse of revival preparations. Again, the same hearty cooperation and unity of the pastors of the leading churches were experienced, and this sympathy on the part of the churches found expression in the denominational papers. The New York Observer thus voiced the sentiment of the Presbyterians. The men who have been invited to New York have given full proof of their efficient ministry by their labors in other places, and our pastors know whom they are addressing when they ask their aid. These evangelists have been proved by the ministers and churches who, of all others, were most likely to condemn them if their doctrines and measures had not been in harmony with the word of God and approved by sound judgment. They have been in the midst of the most orthodox and well-instructed religious communities in Great Britain. Excellent, learned, thoughtful pastors and the most eminent laymen, statesmen, jurists, and bankers have attended their meetings and given their favorable opinion in writing. Presbyteries, synods, general assemblies, dignitaries in the Church of England, and officers under government, men who are not emotional or enthusiasts, who are the furthest removed from religious fanaticism, testify to the great value of the labors of their evangelists. Their discourses have been published and widely read by those who disapprove of such labors as well as by their audiences. I have found no faith in them. Is the, no, I have found no fault in them, is the general verdict. They are simple scriptural calls, calls to the unconverted. God has founded them with his blessing and has made them useful in turning sinners from their wicked ways and in bringing them to Christ. We have also personal testimony from wise men who have been on the ground after the testimony, after the evangelist had been away for a year, 
and they assure us that the work of grace goes forward with no unhappy reaction and with every evidence of continued good. The papers, secular and religious, published long accounts of the meetings, in some instances giving verbatim reports of the addresses, the following vivid descriptions of early Sunday morning service is the open is from the pen of William Hoyt Coleman. It is ten minutes after seven, and at the Madison Avenue entrance there is a compact crowd extending to the curbstone awaiting the openings of the doors for the eight o'clock lecture, a well dressed, good humored crowd that stamps its feet and chats pleasantly. One or two men are giving tickets to those who have come unprovided. Across the street, a lady is accosting several rough-looking young fellows, apparently inviting them to the meeting, but without success. Five minutes later, a door slides back. A gratified ah goes up, and the crowd moves in slowly as the door is partly open. Through a wide passage, through a wide passage, we emerge into a space filled with chairs, surrounded by a low gallery, backed by a huge white board partition, and overhung by an arched roof broken by many skylights. A high K-shaped platform runs from one gallery to the other along the white partitions. At its center is a railed projection for the speaker and his assistant, the rails running back to the partition where there is a doorway with a crimson scream. The right-hand selection of the platform holds a melodon and the choir, the left-hand section the special ticket holders. The hall is nearly full. A mixed assembly of all classes, some very poor, a few not very clean. Many black faces dot the congregation. A large part of those present are evidently Sunday school teachers. One wonders how so many can come at so early an hour. A man nearby says, I built a fire and got my own breakfast. At 7.40, the choir begins to sing and the congregation joins in. Nearly all have brought their little hymn books and the tunes being simple and spirited, they sing in good time. Promptly at 8 o'clock, two men take their places, one within the rail, the other at the melodon. As the former rises after a moment of silent prayer, you see a short, stout-built, square-shouldered man with bullet-shaped head set close on the shoulders, black eyes that twinkle merrily at times, and a full but not heavy beard and mustache. The face expresses fun, good humor, persistence. The coat is closely buttoned with a bit of stand-up collar seen over it. Such is D. L. Moody, the leader of the Hippodrome work. As he stands with head resting on the rail, you are conscious that it is to see, not to be seen. Like an engineer with his hand on the throttle, like a physician with his finger on the patient's pulse, his mind is on the work before him. A quick, socially bearing marks every movement. He gives out a him so rapidly that we scarce catch the words, and then we look at Sankey, a man of larger build, clear-cut features, a shaven chin, a clear voice, melanous, powerful, easier and gentler and bearing than moody. He has enough force and fire in speech and song to hold an audience in perfect quiet. And when he sings alone, you can hear every word and catch from face and, and voice the full meaning of the song. Both men impress you as honest and good, hearty and wholesome in bi body and mind and thoroughly in earnest. After the hymns and a prayer comes a solo by Mr. Sankey, and then Mr. Moody lectures on Jacob. Had long talking, would better describe it. His voice is rough, pitched on one key, and he speaks straight before him, rarely turning to the sides. But how real he makes the men, how visible the deceiving, scheming Jacob stands before us, and how poignantly he ap applies the lessons of the patriarch's life to the men and women before him. His gestures are few, but if effetic. The hand flung forcefully forward with palm open, both hands brought down, hammer-like with closed fists. But the Bible is too much in his hands to allow the frequent gestures. He continually refers to it, reads from it, and keeps it open on the stand beside him. His sermon or lecture is little more than an exposition of a biblical truth or a dramatic rendering of a Bible story with continuous application to his hearers. There is an occasional slip of speech, done, for did, come, for came, is thou, instead, etc. But the Bible knowledge, experience of life, and dead earnestness of the speaker swept every petty criticism out of sight. Though under full headway, 
he sees all that happens. Towards the close of a sermon, a rough young man comes down the aisle, going straight up to the platform steps. How shall we take care of that case? interjects Mr. Moody, and goes quietly on. He ends abruptly, prays briefly, pronounces the benediction, and when you lift your head, he is gone. By the same keen observer, no, a no less interesting uh, description is given of the evening service. Imagine yourself on the platform of Madison Avenue Hall at 7.15 p.m., five minutes before the opening of the doors. Platforms and near gallery are already well filled by the choir. Christian workers and their escorts and special ticket holders. The floor of the house is unoccupied, save by knots of ushers with their wands, no one being allowed to sit there until the doors are open. In the railed enclosure just back of the speaker's place is a telegraph operator, usually a lady. Nearby sits the chief superintendent with aides at hand to transmit orders. At the other end of the hall sit another superintendent and operator. These control the lighting and heating and the seating of the audience. Ting, ting, ting goes a distant bell ten times. Attention. Ting, ting again. And the outer and inner doors slip back at three points. And the three streams of people pour into the hall. The foremost enters at a run that would, would become disorder did not the usher check it. Divide the stream, divide it into the front and middle seats. And when a section is filled, is filled bar the way with his wand. In ten minutes, three thousand. In ten minutes, five thousand persons are seated. The galleries fill more slowly, and when all parts are full, the doors are closed, and no one is allowed to stand in the aisles or along the gallery front, save a few blue-coated policemen, whose services seem rarely called for. The half hour before a meeting time passes quickly. One studies the vast throngs before him with unceasing interest. The bright light of the many reflectors falls full upon the faces of all sorts and conditions of men, to say nothing of women and children. A more mixed multitude it would be hard to find. At the four o'clock meetings, women are the leading element, next to old people, some of them so feeble, as almost to be carried to their seats. But at night, all classes and ages are present. There is a quiet stir everywhere, but no noise or levity. At 7.45, Mr. Thatcher leads the choir in singing and shows great skill in managing both choir and congregation in combination and separate parts and in producing tender and powerful effects. One reason is he has capital music to do it with. The Moody and Sankey hymn book is the best for congregational use ever printed. Its words are full of the gospel. Its tunes express the thoughts that are lied to. Lied to and are so simple and yet positive in character that anyone can sing them after once hearing them. When this vast congregation sings, safe in the arms of Jesus, or I hear thy welcome voice, one gets a new idea of the power of sacred song. Eight o'clock and Mr. Moody is at his post. It is a pleasant night, and though every seat is filled, there is a large crowd outside announcing a hymn, he says. Now, once a thousand of you Christians go into the 4th Avenue Hall and pray for this meeting and let those outside have your seats. Here is a practical application of Christian self-denial, not pleasant to those who have fought for good seats. However, a few go out. Not half enough, said, says Mr. Moody at the end of the first verse. I want a great many more to go out. I see many of you here every night, and if I knew your names, I'd call you out. So after much urging, quite a number leave. The doors are open, and the empty seats are again filled. The platform does not escape. Now some of you, and a few retire. Will the ushers please open the windows? Is the next order. Mr. Moody is autocratic in his demands for fresh air. Fresh air is as important as the sermon, he says. We've got to keep these people awake, and they're half asleep already. All very true, but opening the top back windows throws crude, cruel drafts into the gallery, galleries, so it isn't long before the windows are shut, and very soon Mr. Moody's calling for fresh air again. How he preaches has already been described. The evening sermon is usually of a bolder offhand character than that of the afternoon, which is intended more especially for Christians. He makes a marketed distinction between preaching the gospel and teaching Christians. His afternoon sermon on the Holy Spirit seemed meant for himself as well as for others, and at the close, his voice trembled with emotion as he said, I want more of this power. Pray for me 
that I may be so filled with the Holy Spirit when coming on this platform that men may feel I come with a message from God. The quiet of the audience during Moody's preaching and Sankey's singing is remarkable. Even the rough young fellows who crowd the gallery passages make no sound. At the close, Mr. Moody announces a men's meeting in the other hall, a boys' meeting in the one of the smaller rooms, and their usual work in the inquiry meeting. Those attending these meetings are required to go to them while the last hymn is being sung. The, the Hippodrome work is a vast business enterprise, organized and conducted by businessmen who have put money into it on business principles for the purpose of saving men. But through all the machinery vibrates the power without which it would be useless, the power of the Holy Spirit. Of course, it is successful. Men are being saved day and night, and a moral influence is felt round about the building itself. Two Sundays ago, the police returns of that precinct show no arrest, a thing before unknown. And a recent statement says that in spite of increased dissolution among the poor this winter, there has been no increase of crime. Christians have been warned, limbered up, and taught to work as they have never before, never worked, worked before, taught how to study their Bibles and how to use them for the good of others, how to reach men simply, naturally, and successfully, how to live consistently and wholeheartedly themselves. The easygoing church life of multitudes has been sharply rebuked by those laborist, laborist evangelists. Worshiping in the rude walled hyperdome, sitting on wooden chairs, led in song by a man with a melodrum, and preached to by a man without a pulpit. They have learned that costly churches, stained windows, soft cushions, great organs, and quartet choirs are not necessary to the worship of God, and tend to drive away the poor, leaving the rich to enjoy these luxuries alone. Congregational singing has received a great impetus. The little Moody and Sankey hymn book is crowding out the bulky collection of 1,200 and to 1,400 hymns, some of them one-third unsingable and one-third padding, containing only pieces, new and old, that people can sing. People have found it out and are singing them all over the land and beyond seas in Europe, Asia, and Africa, until 5 million copies in 20 different translations give some idea of the popularity of this little book. With it goes a new idea, that of singing the gospel, for many of these pieces are not hymns at all, but simply gospel songs, and they have been the means of converting many souls. Ministers of the gospel have freely acknowledged that Mr. Moody has taught them valuable lessons in their own work, how to make Bible truths and Bible characters more real, how to use the Bible more freely in preaching, instead of taking a text for a peg on which to hang their own ideas, how to bring the truth into close contact with all sorts of people and make it stick, how to set old Christians and young converts to work. And the whole church is now giving heed to Mr. Moody's ideas about church debt, church fairs, church choirs, and other supposedly necessary evils of modern church life. Mr. Moody's wisdom is, is in accepting invitations to the larger American cities was immediately apparent for the interest awakened in Philadelphia and New York gave him entrance into still larger fields of service. The support of the large secular papers of the East greatly added to his influence in every effort in Christian work in later years. Although in some quarters the tendency was to refer slight, slightingly to the meetings, many apt correspondents expressed their sympathy with the work, even if they did not accept the message that was given. In the Hydrodome, Hyperdome, Mr. Moody was gathered, has gathered day by day the largest audience ever seen in the city said one of the ablest of, of the secular journals. Lawyers, bankers, merchants, some of whom scarcely ever enter our church, are just as much a part of his congregation as are the second-rate and the third-rate boarding house people mentioned so conspicuously in recent published analysis. All classes and conditions of men have been represented in these great revival meetings. Mr. Moody is a man of such persistent consistency that it is scarcely more possible that he should change himself than that to be a biblical uh, figure, a leopard should change his spots. 
Indeed, there is no prospect that he will ever conform either himself or his style to the demands of propriety or to the requirements of uh, grammatical rules. Let us frankly confess as we bid him goodbye that we are heartily glad that he is what he is. We would not change him, make him the best red preacher in the world, and he would instantly lose half his power. He is just right for his work, as he is original, dashing, careless. Mr. Moody reaches the masses more surely and widely because he is one of them himself, and because he has not been made eloquent and faultless by the trimming and restraining process of our liberal education. His very um, skillism sounds sweetly in our, um, our ears. His familiarity and conversational manner pleases them. They like his directness and his earnestness. He is driving a bargain with them, and he talks sense. He is trying to comfort them when the world's bitter win they are seeking shelter. He is trying to comfort them when, from the world's bitter wind, they are seeking shelter, and he fills their souls with the assurance of a father's love. There they sit and listen, the poor, the distressed, the afflicted, the sorrowful, taking their fill of deep and liquid rest, forgetful of all ill. Life becomes pleasanter to them. The future assumes a hopeful aspect. Mr. Moody touches more chords than the ordinary preacher on Sunday. He comes nearer home. He nourishes them more. His society is more refreshing. They go away from the hippodrome, brightened and strengthened. They like Mr. Moody, and so does almost everybody. Hence, we would not on any account have him change himself. We enjoy his rude simplicity and his pell-mell earnestness, his downright individuality, and his uncalculating naturalness. An interesting incident occurred at this time is related by Professor George P. Fisher of the Yale Divinity School, as illustrated Mr. Moody's sincerity and courageous frankness, as well as his kindness. Says Professor Fisher, I once passed an evening in company with Mr. Thurlow Weed, who was long a leader in the politics of New York and in the Civil War, was sent abroad on a kind of unofficial embassy to confer with men of power in England. In the course of a long conversation, Mr. Weed asked if, I knew Mr. Moody, and added that Mr. Moody wrote him an excellent letter, which he would like to read to me. It was an acknowledgment of a very generous contribution from Mr. Weed to defray the expenses of the meetings held in New York. Mr. Weed did not himself mention the occasion of the letter, but he afterwards sent me a copy of it. And this is the letter. Mr. Weed, my dear friend, yours of the 20th of March with check came to hand yesterday, and I am at a loss to know what to do. I am afraid you put it in with some other good deeds, and they may keep you from coming to Christ as a lost sinner. I wish you knew how anxious I am for you, and how I long to see you out and out on the Lord's side. I thank you for the money, but what would you say if I should treat your gift as you have the gift of God and send it back to you? Would you not be offended? Now as I take your gift, will you not take God's gift, and let us rejoice together? I cannot bear to leave the city and lead you out of the ark that God has provided for you and all the rest of us. Hoping to hear soon of your conversion, I remain your friend and brother, I hope, in Christ. Signed, D.L. Moody. When the meetings were in progress, the tablet, a Roman Catholic paper, devoted two columns in one issue to the work of the evangelist saying in its review, This work of Mr. Moody is not sin. It cannot be sin to invite men to love and serve Jesus Christ. It is irregular, unauthorized, but it may be bringing multi multitudes to a happier frame of mind in which the church may find them better prepared to receive her sublime faith. Whatever philosophical skeptics may say, said the New York Times, the work accomplished this winter by Mr. Moody in this city for private and public morals will live. The drunkard have become sober. The vicious, the virtuous, the worldly and self-seeking selfishness, unselfishness, the um, in ignoble, noble, the impure, pure, the youth have started with more generous aims. The old have been stirred from grossness. A new hope has, has lifted up hundreds of human beings. A new consolation has come to the sorrowful, and a better principle has entered the sordid life of the, of the day through the labors of those plain men. Whatever the prejudiced may say against them, the honest-minded and just will not forget their labors of love. 
Years after these series of meetings have ended, it was not an uncommon question for the critics to ask, where are the converts of the hippodrome? Without making any effort to investigate the matter themselves, they demanded data forthwith from those who expressed their confidence in the efficiency of special evangelistic effort. The Christians in many of the churches in New York and other cities who first made their profession of faith at these meetings had no distinguishing mark by which they could be at once recognized by the casual observer. But there was hardly a city that Mr. Moody visited during the remaining 25 years of the evangelistic career where he did not come across those who had first come to the knowledge of Christ in the old Pennsylvania freight depot of Philadelphia or in the Hypodome in New York in the winter of 1875-76. The following testimony of a New York pastor writing 20 years later is but one of the many of that Mr. Moody frequently received. It has been said by some of the pastors of the more wealthy churches in the city that but little permanent good resulted to their churches from the series of meetings held by you in this city in 1876. This may be true so far as the churches named are concerned, but it certainly is not true regarding my own church. In 1876, there were received 139 persons. Of this number, 121 came on confession of their faith in Christ, and the larger part of them were brought to Christ directly through the influence of the great revival meetings in that year. These converts have worn well. Only a very small percentage have fallen away. Never since that day have we received so large a number in any one year. The greatest blessing that could come to this meeting at this time would be such a work as was then carried on so successfully. What this city needs more than anything else is the preaching of the old gospel. It has lost none of its power. All substitutes have failed. And it is time to come back to the simple teaching of the gospel of the cross of Christ. You are doing a great work in Copper and Cooper Union and in Carnegie Hall now. And may God bless you and encourage you and give you more and more the baptism of the Holy Spirit.